especially back in the early days. You know, when I started, the, the battery gigafactory was still just a patch of dirt. You know, we hadn't even broke ground yet. So it was much more of a, a startup itself. You know, there are about 15 of us in the Nevada division, you know, told to go build the biggest factory in the world to make the best batteries in the world and to do so without consuming any energy. Is, is working to help design this battery gigafactory and help ramp up the manufacturing side. And as we saw these different types of intermediate waste products, these end-of-life cells and modules and packs piling up without any infrastructure within the U.S. to be able to treat them, my team and I really decided to develop this process in-house. So we left Tesla about two years ago and we joined American Battery Technology Company and we're now working to commercialize our first recycling facility. So we have our, our 20,000 metric ton per year recycling facility under construction right now in northern Nevada. The physical building is nearing completion, and then throughout the rest of this year, we'll be installing and commissioning all of our process equipment. People say defect rate, a lot of times they think it means you know, a final cell or a final pack that goes through a quality check, but it's each one of those nodes. So those numbers you're quoting, if you look at it just on a, on a mass basis, it actually ends up being quite a bit higher as well. Different types of powders and slurries and scrap metals all become waste products. And a lot of those intermediate and maybe unconventional waste products are even harder for conventional companies to recycle. So those pile up on these sites and manufacturing facilities. They're not quite sure what to do with them. And again, by having a reverse manufacturing process, we don't simply mix all the materials together and put them in the front end. So when we have our, our module section dissecting down to the cell level, any defects we receive at the cell level, we feed into that intermediate feed stage where it's already in the partially deconstructed set. And then the same with the powders and slurries. We feed those towards the back end of our system where the recycling stream is already back down to powders and slurries.
I don't think there will be a technology that's a winner because the chemistry of batteries is not fixed. There's not a winner on the battery side. It's dramatic amounts of R&D going into the battery manufacturing side. And as that keeps improving, the recycling industry has to keep improving with it. And that's why these have to be dynamic facilities. I mean, as far as who's actually going to be the winner, I think it really comes back to this closed loop economy and the fact that these elements are never consumed if they're handled correctly. So what I really see happening is these types of you know, partnerships or alliances or consortia between companies in each of those different groups of the circular economy. If you have a battery recycler and a primary metal extraction company with a cathode company and other metal refiners and a cell company and a vehicle company working together, you can essentially own that material indefinitely.